uh, rap group uh, because uh, that's going to be barred. It's been barred by Facebook and by Twitter. It's one of 900 accounts that are believed established by the Chinese government to deliberately sow discord by undermining the legitimacy of the political protest movement in China. That, that's a direct quote. And along with that, they're going to shut down accounts for a larger network of about 200,000 Twitter accounts uh, before they even become active. Facebook's head of cybersecurity said that the, they had also removed Facebook accounts for 15,000 people and another uh, 2,200 members who were under investigation as having dangerous connections to China. And the new uh, controls, however, they went out of their way to say, don't apply to taxpayer-funded entities in the U.S. Now, that means groups like the National Endowment for Democracy, in case you're wondering what, what uh, tax-funded entities are talking about. So any of their sites aren't under attack. They also said it wouldn't apply to the Voice of America and other U.S.-owned or UK-owned, like the BBC, social media platforms. So the only ones who apparently are spreading any disinformation on the protests uh, is anyone who's supportive of China. And, and they are going to remove their sites. Uh, seems two-faced. It seems contradictory. Any position that undermines the legitimacy of the political positions of the Hong Kong protest movement isn't going to be allowed to stay up. So tonight's an experiment. We'll see how long even this live stream stays up, right? Uh, but it's important to know what they're trying to do. They want to project one message, and they want to demand that the people of the whole world only get that message. Now, what are the demonstrations in Hong Kong? What are the issues? We're told again and again and again that these demonstrators are simply pro-democracy. And that's why the U.S. government is so overwhelmingly supportive. Why are the protesters regularly flying U.S. and British and Hong Kong colonial flag, the old colonial flag, in their demonstrations? both in the mass demonstrations and even in the, in the street confrontations as they break into things, as they're flowing, uh, throwing uh, Molotov cocktails and flaming bricks and bars and so on. And, and how did a movement in China, because this is part of China, come to identify so strongly with the U.S. and with Britain? This is a question, because there are a lot of people in the streets, and we don't want to deny that, but we want to understand how this came about. The corporate media has given more coverage than it's ever given to any protest, and every major Democratic or Republican politician has praised these pro-democracy demonstrations. Now, for everyone here tonight, it's against capitalism, the theft of our labor, the impoverishment of the vast majority for the benefit of the super rich. And we're also against killer cops and racist courts, mass incarceration, the raids and roundups of ICE. We oppose the more than 800 U.S. bases around the world, U.S. coups, U.S. wars, U.S. invasions, sanctions. We fight for health care, for housing. And always we oppose the ruling class right here. That's a fundamental question. So we take sides in the class struggle. We're not neutral. So what's our view? When people are in the streets, do we just automatically support them? It can be easy on, a, on Gaza, on Haiti, on the yellow vests in France, on the Philippines, on the Black Lives Matter movement on all the demonstrations in solidarity with migrants, against the caging of children, the LGBTQ struggle. And in all of this, we know the importance of symbols. 
We know what it means if a demonstration, like in Charlottesville, uses a Confederate flag or swastikas. We, we know what that means. Or they're wearing the Make America Great red Trump hats. Or militia outfits. We know that we're on the opposite side and that these movements are a deadly threat to poor and working people and to all people of color, to the LGBTQ people, and especially to migrants. Now, in another culture, it can be harder to see if, what's it mean if you're carrying a British flag, if you're carrying a Hong Kong colonial flag, what's that mean? So it's not gonna make sense unless we look at it in the context of China's history and long liberation struggle. And unless you see it that way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. What does it mean if you tear down the symbol of the People's Republic of China and put up the British flag? It's clear you're on the other side, and that's a side of racism and war and colonialism. Now, if you praise the way things were in the past, I think here in the US we all get it. If you cry out for the lost cause or the old South, wasn't it grand? If you want to build statues that memorialize fallen soldiers, we know that means war and racism and reaction of the most vicious sort. There is a reactionary mass movement in Hong Kong that's based on building entitlement, arrogance, maintaining a demand of special status, and it is rooted in Hong Kong's colonial past. And that's exactly what the movement in Hong Kong is saying. Hong Kong should have, maintain its special status, it's a special administrative zone. We don't wanna be part of China. So let's ask how did Hong Kong's special status come about? Hong Kong has actually had special status for 200 years. It was the most spectacular deep water port on the South China Sea at the mouth of the Pearl River, the largest trade river. And it was stolen from China in a war that set the whole cities in flames. I want to talk about that just a little bit. When the British and the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the US merchants were setting up colonies and trading stations, and also forcing peoples throughout Africa, throughout the Americas, throughout Asia, to sign completely unequal treaties when there was any treaty at all. It was an era of aggressive slave trade, the genocide of the indigenous peoples. And during this time toward China, the British and the US and the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and the Portuguese were all anxious to trade with China. They wanted the porcelain, the silk, the tea, but capitalism by its very nature is an aggressive expansionist system that's never satisfied. It's insatiable. It drives for more. So what these merchants wanted was free access to China's market, no restrictions, and China didn't want to give access. They want to trade with payment in silver and just in special trading areas. It was a feudal social structure, very highly developed. Now, Britain set up a whole industry in India to grow and cure and refine, concentrate opium. They produced tons of it, boatloads of it. It was a huge industry. This is a warehouse, top to bottom. British merchants began the sale of opium from India to China, and US merchants, they had similar warehouses and were involved in the trade of opium from Turkey. The Chinese government felt this was a very dangerous drug and they tried to prohibit it as millions and millions of people became addicted. And they first outlawed it, and then when that had no impact on the merchants, 
they seized and burned two and a half million pounds of opium, just what was in the warehouses at that time. There were two wars fought and lost by China to try to restrict the opium trade, but they didn't have the military technology of the West. There was a, a British invasion of China with gunboats more powerful than any weapons that the Chinese Empire had. And the British, in a, in a block with the other imperialist powers, set up a blockade of the Pearl River. They sent a full-scale military expedition, naval expedition, with 44 armed steamships, heavy cannon, rockets, infantry, long-range fire. And the antiquated uh, Chinese warships were absolutely destroyed. And then the British ships sailed not only up the Pearl River, up the Zhujiang River, the Yangtze River. They occupied Shanghai, seized the tax collection barges, did, it literally looted entire cities. China was defeated and was forced to sign a completely unequal treaty, a whole series of unequal treaties. The US also had a whole series of completely unequal treaties that gave these merchants access to all the major port cities in China. And in fact, these treaties were really terms of surrender. China was actually forced to pay reparations for the burned opium. And these fleets of ships, US Navy, British Navy, they had riverboats that sailed a thousand miles inland, dominated also all the coastal waters. This map is very interesting if you can make it out, but it's, it shows this network going into all the rivers of China for the opium trade. A lot of other trade, if, if you didn't like the terms a merchant gave, you simply blasted the gunboats and destroyed the warehouse. That settled it, and this was well understood. The, there was foreign military stationed in China to back up. It was not only the warships. There were US Marines on the armored warships all along the China's coast, and there were special fleets of river gunboats, the US Navy. So this is something we don't study in history. US Marines patrolled China's rivers a thousand miles inland, and they were there to enforce trade interests, and suppress uprisings. And there were many uprisings, many. There were US Marines stationed, garrisoned in Beijing, in Guangzhou, then called Canton, in Shanghai. From 1818 to 1949, that is 130 years of occupation, and you won't find it in a US history book. They trained and educated a whole army of collaborators and administrators. There were Christian minister, minis, missionaries who established churches. European law in all matters took precedence. This uh, pompous military officers of all the imperialist countries gathered together, it's like a group photo, it shows they operated as one in this theft. Now, China called this a century of humiliation. I think I Maybe I skipped a, a photo in here, so keep it on there for a bit. Um, Hong Kong, the Britain's deep water port, military and naval base, its warehouses, was a base of operations for this entire imperialist domination. Now, the Chinese Revolution, yeah, there we are, uh, was one of the biggest upheavals in history. The standing of the Chinese Communist Party is based in no small part on its ability over the past 70 years to break with the humiliations, chaos, and constant war, the famines caused by past gunboat diplomacy, the decades of occupation by numerous foreign troops, the harsh and unequal treaties, the new communist government intention was to ensure stable development, broad prosperity, while resisting foreign intervention. 
And this was a promise that Mao Zedong made in October 1949 while proclaiming the founding of the People's Republic of China. Go, go back one. Uh, Mao declared the Chinese people comprising a quarter of humanity have now stood up. In the same talk, he warned that every day and every minute the imperialists will try to stage a comeback. It's inevitable, it's beyond all doubt. But we will emerge in the world as a nation with an advanced culture, our national defense will be consolidated, and no imperialists will ever again be allowed to invade our land. So there was great determination, but China was also an impoverished country, war-torn, underdeveloped in every way, a peasant economy, almost no industry or infrastructure, mass illiteracy, no equal rights. Let's switch to the next. Enormous poverty, and that's what we want to address because this is a change today in China from massive poverty to incredible levels of development. China's growth has also been amazing and steady. There's never been a recession or a depression in 70 years. So it's a steady improvement in the standard of living. There have been many struggles over political line, over what path of economic development, many struggles internally. But the Chinese Communist Party has maintained control and steered through and kept the country unified and it's no small accomplishment. The UN figures it's the first country that actually succeeded in ending poverty and illiteracy. Those aren't just China's figures, those are UN admission. And during this time, both Hong Kong and Taiwan were the backdoor escape routes for the warlords and the feudal lords and the Chinese and foreign capitalists escaping the Chinese Revolution. And that both the US in Taiwan and Britain in Hong Kong provided a military and economic cover to pull these areas of China away from the revolution and use them as a, as a spear against the revolution. Now, in 1967, there was an uprising in Hong Kong. Let's go back to Hong Kong because really we could spend days, weeks, books, and have that's all been done, movies, on the Chinese Revolution. But let's see what was happening in Hong Kong. Uh, in 1967, there was an uprising in Hong Kong started by the lowest paid women workers who made plastic flowers. It grew into a general strike. And that strike and that uprising confirmed to the world that British colonialism's days were, even in Hong Kong, were numbered. As they were elsewhere at that time. You think of the 50s and the 60s, in Africa, in Asia, in the Caribbean. A strike was organized by the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. It was led by the Chinese Communist Party members in Hong Kong. And this union federation still has about over 400,000, 415,000 members in Hong Kong, and it remains to this day pro-China. This uprising was brutally suppressed. There were at least, this is by British admission, maybe more are claimed, but 51 people killed and many simply disappeared. Now, we should be clear whenever they talk about past democracy in Hong Kong that there were absolutely no rights on the books whatsoever under British colonialism. There was no right to free speech or freedom of assembly or freedom of unions. Democracy did not exist. And Britain was determined to make the same arrangements with Hong Kong that they had with their other former colonies who gained formal independence but were still economically chained to British imperialism. That's what the British Commonwealth is all about, isn't it? So let's get to 1997 
where there was a formal return of Hong Kong to China's sovereignty. It was under an agreement called One Country, Two Systems. Hong Kong as a center of finance capital would remain in place, and, but all foreign intervention and colonial claims on Hong Kong were supposed to end. Now, let's look at what capitalist relations in place have meant in Hong Kong. There's billions of dollars that have flowed through Hong Kong's banks from capitalist investment in the new factories that were set up in China. And that money has just poured in through the banks and back to the US and Britain and the whole imperialist system. It didn't go to the people of Hong Kong. It's today a city with the greatest inequality in the world. Most billionaires compared to the greatest poverty. Now, the Heritage Foundation lists Hong Kong as number one with the freest economy out of 180 countries in the world. Because it's free, because it has no restrictions on the banks, has low taxes, has no restraints. The rents are also the highest. Millions live in really terrible conditions in this modern city. It's hard to imagine that these wire dog kennels are considered housing. But there's more than 200,000 working people who pay rent to live in these terrible cages. The poverty rate in Hong Kong is one of the highest. It's about 20% of the population, one in five. And it's growing. It's growing. There's also millions of young people who can't afford their own apartments and they know in their lifetime they'll never have it. They're angered, alienated, frustrated. Almost all apartments are subdivided into tiny spaces, sublet to others. Whole families live in one room, except for the very rich. And then there's the homeless in Hong Kong. That means that even a cage is unaffor unaffordable. And their numbers have tripled in the last five years. Now, the US and British efforts to undercut Hong Kong's return began in advance of their signing in 1997. Shortly before the transfer of sovereignty, Britain hastily set up, after 150 years of appointed officials, a partially elected but still mainly appointed government. And they established and funded political parties composed of their loyal collaborators. I want to talk a little bit about how this culture is maintained, because it didn't happen naturally. This is Alan Weinstein. He's a founder of the National Endowment for Democracy. He told the Washington Post, it's a rather stunning admission to do in an interview, to say so publicly. He said, a lot of what we do today was done covertly 25 years ago by the CIA. Damn right, it was. The NED, National Endowment for Democracy, funds, coordinates, and weaponizes non-governmental NGOs organizations and social organizations with the capacity to put tens of thousands of misdirected, idealistic, and alienated youth on the streets. Millions of dollars were openly and secretly funneled into a whole network of protected social service organizations, political parties, media, social media, student and youth organizations, labor unions, all with the idea of how to undercut support for China and the Communist Party of China. The NED bankrolls the Hong Kong Human Rights Movement, the Hong Kong Journalists Association, the Civic Party, the Labor Party, the Democratic Party, almost any organization that sort of sounds like something here or around the world, they'll have a name in Hong Kong, but it has a different role. They have a solidarity center, too. They fund the Human Rights Civil Rights Fund, 
Civil Human Rights Front that coordinates these demonstrations. They also set up something called the Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions. That's not the Hong Kong Federation. See how close the names are? And it receives National Endowment for Democracy funding, along with British support, and Rockefeller and Soros and a lot of others, to promote pro-democracy, independent unions throughout China. It was established in 1990 to counter and undercut the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, which, as I said, has some 400,000 members. This funded organization does have, though, about 120,000 members, and it includes especially professional staff, uh, social workers, uh, the airline pilots, when you think of the demonstrations at the airport and the crews, and so on. Now, the largest role of the NGOs and the church groups and the student federation and the union federations was to create a climate that glorifies past British and US role. And it looks to Western imperialism. British colonial past is deeply mythologized. And there's been 22 years since 1997, 22 years of constant nostalgia for this past, this supposedly glorious time. And that has a big influence on impoverished youth who've grown up with this, being the dominant culture in the youth and in church groups and in all kinds of organizations. There's 37,000 funded NGOs with staff in the tens of thousands. And they're able to put a small army of contra forces on the streets. That's absolutely true. He's both in mass confrontations with support and violent confrontations that there's training for. And that training is pretty open. You can find it on the internet in 100 places. The US State Department and US politicians openly meet with the leadership of this movement. It is, as China says, this is an effort at a color revolution, such as happened in the Ukraine, such as happened in Syria or in Serbia, Venezuela. Every effort to undermine and sabotage. Now, there's a larger effort to pull Hong Kong away from China as, as a way to really disrupt the socialist direction of China, which is becoming stronger and stronger, and, and imperialism is just beginning to realize that. So the goal is to promote a hostile, suspicious attitude toward China, toward communism, toward every form of socialism, and to foster a false concept of a past democratic Hong Kong with a distinct identity. Now, we could ask ourselves, is this just coincidence, or is this part of the arrest of the CEOs from China, the effort to block Huawei and 5G technology, the ban on software, the electronic components of Huawei technology? Is this part of the trade war? Is it connected to the military encirclement of China with missiles and 400 bases and aircraft carriers? Is it connected to the trade war? or the effort to block China's companies from global markets? Is this a distinct development, or is this part of a full court press against China to see if they can dislocate the leadership and the policies? Now, Xinhua News had an interesting editorial. They said, obviously, the US arrogant demands are beyond the scope of trade negotiations and touch on China's fundamental economic system. It shows that behind the US trade war against China, the US is trying to invade China's economic sovereignty and force China to damage its core interests. So that's, that's really even how China, they understand what this is. China today has a highly skilled and educated working class, many times larger than the US and the European Union and Japan all combined. It has advanced technology, internal cohesion, 
and many trading partners, and getting more and stronger trading partners. So it's in a strong position to resist U.S. demands, but that doesn't mean the demands aren't being made. There's lots of capitalists in China. We should admit that. It's a contradictory policy. We should admit that. But the state industries predominate, and they are becoming stronger and stronger. And the largest banks are all state-owned. Now, just across the river, I'm going to wind up on this, from Hong Kong, sits the city of Shenzhen. It was one of the special economic zones established to lure Western technology. And these zones originally, with thousands of labor-intensive factories, millions of workers earned low wages, and they were centers of capitalist exploitation and enormous profits for U.S. and other global capitalists. Shenzhen grew from a fishing village, then to a small city of 30,000 in 1979, to a megacity of 20 million, with the largest migrant population also in China. It has a population three times the size of Hong Kong, just next door. It's just on the other side of the river. With investments via Hong Kong, this new city became a massive, polluted factory town with sweatshops spewing out dark clouds of toxic smoke. That's a fact. The central government and the Chinese Communist Party made a decision to reverse course in Shenzhen and in all the cities of China. This was a big discussion to give priority not only to raising the standard of living and education and consumer goods, but also to really change the environment and the climate and the living conditions and to use central planning to quickly reach these goals. And their goals are way beyond the uh, Green New Deal of the Democratic Party here. We should just, real they are way beyond. Today, Shenzhen has the largest fleet of electric buses in the world, about 16,000, has all electric cabs. And, and that's just in the last five years since this policy began. In the past five years, through city and national urban planning, Shenzhen is today one of the most livable cities in China, with extensive parks, has tree-lined streets. It aims to have fully 80% of its new buildings green certified by next year, 2020. It's full of apartment blocks and office towers and modern factories with advanced equipment, manufacturing and robotics and automation and giant tech startups. Now, the Chinese government announced this week that they intend to build this southern city of Shenzhen into a pilot demonstration of socialism with Chinese characteristics, that they're going to go much further. And they said Hong Kong is not suitable to hold up the major role of the greater what they call Bay Area strategy, and the home court will be China's mainland cities. Now, the Greater Bay Area is now a population center of some 80 million people. So you could see that Hong Kong is now a small piece of this. They were once 27% of the GDP of China, and today it's 3% and going down fast. So if that, if the banking changes, and that money starts even more flowing into Shenzhen, well, that, that is saying something to Hong Kong. Shenzhen will become one of the leading cities of the world in terms of economic strength. This is their goal, quality of development, its research and development input, industrial innovation capacity, quality of public services, ecological environment. They plan for it to be first rate with advanced communication and medical instruments being a specialty. The city plans to establish, I, yeah, the city plans to establish a maritime university, a national deep sea research center, and explore the establishment of a maritime development bank. 
Uh, they, they are really developing uh, urban agriculture in new and kind of incredible ways that um, are, are hard to even, for us to even grasp here, but it does show what planning is capable of. So I just want to conclude by saying that they're choices. And do we stand with development, with dramatic reductions in poverty, with increasing the levels of skill and literacy, or with the cages and homelessness in Hong Kong, financed and funded movements that are organized by the National Endowment for Democracy. These are the choices, and they're not explained here, and they need to be much more, because it's part of the movement here. This propaganda is aimed directly at the movement in the US in an effort to flip it, to turn it, to be suspicious of socialist development, of planning, to feel demoralized and cynical, angry and alienated. And if we're going to combat it, we need to combat it with ideas and also with planning and with building a deep support for the ability of socialism to meet the challenge of a new age. Thank you.